Sweden and Finland are two countries that have clung to their positions of neutrality for decades, like a couple of fence-sitting straddlers. But on May 18th, that all changed when they officially handed in their letter of application to join the NATO military alliance. In this video, I want to examine the different, unique, specialized military assets and strategies that Sweden and Finland bring to the table. Find out how long it's going to take for this application process to finalize. Fortunately, military bureaucracy is lightning fast. They lost my back pay paperwork almost instantly. And we're going to analyze the massive geopolitical consequences that this will have for the entire Baltic region. I think we're going to see how we can learn about Arctic and naval warfare from these two countries. We're going to take a look at the retaliatory measures that the Russian military can take against what they see as NATO expansionism. So as you guys know, I really enjoy researching geopolitical topics for the channel, and now I've found a way where I can really capitalize on those lessons I've learned in Conflict of Nations, World War III. In this free online player versus player game, you can choose a real country to lead in modern war. At the core of the game is an exciting real-time combat system that places you in control of an existing nation and its army. Plus, the game lets you play against a max of 128 other real-time players, build your military power with a variety of units from tanks, jets, and submarines. Your army's logistics and supply chains make a huge difference in the outcome of the war. You can use the same account to play on your phone and on your PC. Click the link in the description to receive 13,000 gold and a 30-day membership. So what kind of military equipment and assets do Sweden and Finland bring to the table? Let's start with Finland. It's a huge landmass of 130,000 square miles, which is about the same size as Germany. They have a small population of 5.5 million people only about 1.3% of their population, or 70,000 people, are from Russian descent or speak Russian. Finland is geopolitically important to NATO, partly because they share a long 1,340 kilometer border directly with Russia. Only a few kilometers across that border is Russia's Kola Peninsula. This is the only part of Russia's coastline that has year-round ice-free access to the Atlantic Ocean. It's home to Russia's northern fleet that is the most of their nuclear ballistic missile submarines. The real value of adding Finland to NATO is their maritime border with Russia, because that region is incredibly important to Russia's naval and commercial shipping power. 60% of Russia's maritime exports pass through the Baltic Sea. By joining NATO, Finland would be allowing their land and sea assets to be used by the West to coordinate defensive or offensive military operations in the region. So, hypothetically, if NATO wanted to initiate a land invasion or a sea blockade of Russia, that means Finland would most likely have to cooperate now. The Finnish Defense Forces have a total of 280,000 wartime troops, which sounds like a lot for a European country, especially for a small size like they have. But that number is kind of misleading, because it has the qualifier wartime attached to it. This is the number of troops that they could potentially activate, including conscripts and reserve forces. That number includes all the old ancient soldiers like myself who've been out for 10 years just eating Carlean pies. It's not really indicative of their actual military manpower, which is only about 21,000 soldiers. And even that number is kind of inaccurate, because 19,000 of those are conscripts. Finland's decision to use conscripts has a couple of pros and cons. On the plus side, it ties the civilian population closer to what is at stake in the military community, and it creates a greater level of cohesion. On the downside, conscripts only serve for a year and are usually poorly motivated and trained. Although there's always exceptions to the rule, I managed to be both unmotivated and poorly trained even though I volunteered to enlist. Finland claims that they've reached the NATO spending guideline this year of 2% of their GDP, which is 0.4% higher than the average current NATO country defense spending. One of the things that comes along with qualifying to be a NATO member is that your military spending needs to be transparently available. This is done to help avoid the kind of corruption where your military generals end up spending your whole defense budget on vodka in Helsinki. But the way they spend it is really interesting, and we can actually look at an exact breakdown. This tells us about where their priorities are. So their greatest percentage of spending by far is $1.5 billion 
allocated to the HX fighter jet program, which will be the F-35 fighter jet that they're acquiring. This tells me that the country wants to project security across the Baltic Sea and their entire border by leaning into air power. Another interesting thing to note here is that they only spend about $378,000 a year on maintenance, which is down slightly from last year's $412,000. This number is able to be so small because historically the Finnish military, when you look at how their logistics and their military operates, they've always relied on and used their railroad network to supply their troops with only approximately 200 logistics trucks and only 60 main logistics trucks in their arsenal. And those trucks are used to transport in between units. Their forces are ranked number 53 out of 142 countries on the global firepower scale. But this doesn't account for their greatest secret weapon, which is trees. Trees help Finland's military as much as any other weapon system that they have in their arsenal. The reason for this is because their country is made up of 70% heavily forested areas with zero roads that are covered in thousands of these small lakes and marshes. This would slow down and prevent any large armored vehicle convoy from easily invading, and it would bog down any advancing force. This is the reason Finland doesn't have a lot of main battle tanks. They only have a 239 of their Leopard German-made main battle tanks because they're mostly gonna be useless in most battles on their land. That's obviously a generalization, but instead what they're choosing to do is really interesting. It's they're purchasing 200 of the BVS-10 amphibious, tiny all-terrain tracked vehicles. They're like baby tanks kind of, with the only downside being that they can only stop incoming small arms rounds, but it's a great way to do hit and run tactics. The Finnish specialize in this kind of Arctic combat. They even have regiments of ski infantry trained to ski around on the slopes and to hit and run with guerrilla tactics. So their plan is for their forces to never stay in contact for too long. The whole key to their defensive plan is to be fast moving and light. And looking into their list of military equipment, that they release each year, we can see that they operate 102 of the modern CV-90 infantry fighting vehicles, which are recently given a $32 million upgrade to their turret, which gives it a new electrical optic aiming system. The reason they use the CV-90 is because it has the best performance on the snowy, wintry landscape that makes up a lot of their country most of the year round. And this system was developed entirely by their next door neighbors, BAE Systems a Swedish defense company that we're gonna get into in a minute. Of the over 600 troop transport vehicles that they have, only 62 of them are the modern Patria AMV vehicle. There are some estimates that say Finland has over 1,500 artillery pieces, and a lot of sources claim that they are one of Europe's biggest artillery powers, but I kind of disagree. I think this is sort of inaccurate because those numbers include everything down to their small 102 millimeter mortar tubes that are carried around and used by dismounted infantry. In reality, Finland has closer to 700 of the old Soviet era artillery pieces, which are inaccurate compared to Western artillery. As we've recently learned, it can be difficult to kind of untangle the differences between what a military force has on paper and what it has in reality. So on a whole, their forces are made up of a mix of old Soviet era equipment and new high-tech Western armored vehicles. I don't think they need a huge military in order to deter Russia. Just by looking at their infantry and the equipment that they use, they clearly place a big emphasis in the important areas, like they use night vision and they have optics on all of their weapons. These kind of things might seem minor, but it's exactly the kind of thing that leads to troops having confidence in their equipment. Which leads us into another very important factor that I want to talk about. Even with all of those weapons, as we've seen, when Afghanistan fell in just a matter of a few weeks, None of that really matters if your soldiers do not have unit cohesion or fighting spirit. This is hard to try to quantify. There is no line item on a defense budget where you can invest more dollars into motivating your Finnish soldiers face down the very real possibility of having to die for their country. What I'm saying is can we possibly know how Finnish soldiers will fight in combat? Will they quickly give in or fight to the last man? but I still think we can find some hard evidence that paints a picture of how a country's soldiers would potentially fight. My two pieces of evidence that the Finnish are brave, excellent fighters comes from their, first of all, their willingness to fight alongside NATO forces in Afghanistan, and secondly, the two times that they fought Russia 
when they were invaded in World War II and World War I. In 2015, they decided to change their whole strategy from this old concept where they were gonna try to hold as much land initially as possible, and they realized that tactic was gonna have a lot of weaknesses where the enemy could potentially flank them. So they've updated and changed their whole concept of how they wanna fight. The new plan revolves around being flexible, mobile, and leaving room for the idea of tactically retreating and drawing the enemy into your own traps. This way the front line is all over the country. The reason this is next generation warfare is because the military planners here are thinking about the battle in terms of depth, instead of just a 2D front line. From Finland's perspective, joining NATO would guarantee they do not get invaded a third time by Russia. When I hear of a country being neutral, I instantly associate that with taking the moral high ground. You know, they want world peace, it sounds like. But on the world stage, neutrality is often criticized by experts and perceived as being blind or indifferent towards the fate of others. I don't think Sweden or Finland are indifferent towards others. Uh, so what's really going on here? Russia's invasion of Ukraine has radically changed the way European countries consider their defensive alliances. To put things into perspective for you, when Finland and Sweden were polled about whether or not they wanted to join NATO last year in 2021, only 30% of them said they wanted to join. Fast forward a couple months, and over 76% now want to join. You might say, but wait, isn't 80% of Russia's ground forces already committed to combat in Ukraine? How could they possibly hope to invade another country? The answer comes from Dmitry Medeziev, seen here whispering sweet nothings into Putin's ear. The deputy chairman of Russia's Security Council, who on May 12th issued a warning of, quote, full-fledged nuclear war if NATO continues pumping weapons into Ukraine. Increasingly, Russia appears to be leaning on the threat of total annihilation. Russia has already started to respond to these movements. Video evidence was posted online just a few days ago where their forces were shown moving nuclear missiles towards Finland's border on May 16th. We see seven of their Iskander missile launchers were moved 24 miles from the Finnish border leading to Voyeborg. The Russians said their response would be military technical action, which is the fancy new way of saying hybrid warfare. That includes cyber attacks like the ones that were launched against NATO member Estonia in 2007. Sweden is an entirely different story with a history of neutrality that stretches even further back to 200 years ago into the past. They have twice the amount of people with a population of 10.3 million and an active military of 24,000 soldiers. They ended conscription in 2010, but they reintroduced it in a small way, calling up about 4,000 troops in 2017. They have a slightly higher budget of 8.6 billion USD, which is about 1.2% of their GDP down from 4% during the Cold War. As you can see here, Sweden drew the long straw when it came to their geographic placement to Russia. Finland has always been a safety buffer for them, but they don't take advantage of this situation. They really respect Finland for this. The geography of Sweden absolutely dominates the Baltic Sea, and if NATO chose to apply more pressure on Russia's economy through their maritime trade, they would absolutely need Sweden's help. To be clear, there would be no hard or fast obligation for Sweden to contribute to anything other than an Article 5 collective defense operation where one country is attacked. That's the only scenario where NATO can get pushy. Control of Sweden's Gotland Island is vital. It's a small island directly in the center of the Baltic Sea, which has been demilitarized after the Cold War, but Sweden recently remilitarized it and sent armored units there. This is an ideal strategic location for a logistics hub to resupply and fuel ships in the Baltic Sea. I've talked a lot about the positive sides of these countries joining the NATO alliance because I'm biased towards that, obviously. But there are some downsides, and I want to present the best possible, strongest argument for them not joining. Critics say that if Sweden joined NATO, they could become over-reliant on United States influence, and they would feel pressure to make political decisions in their favor that aren't necessarily in Sweden's best interest. The defense pledge could force Sweden into a war that they don't want to be involved in, and critics of NATO point out that as the alliance grows, the chances of being drawn into a global conflict increases, because an attack on a country like Estonia needs to be treated in the same way that an attack on New York City would. Other critics say that this is NATO expansionism that is provoking Russia into invading countries like Ukraine. 
To me, this is a chicken or the egg question, right? What came first, Russian aggression or NATO expansionism? I think history clearly shows Russian aggression is the culprit, but, but that's just me. Ironically, even though Sweden is a famously neutral military power, they're traditionally well known around the world for being the best engineers of some of the Western powers' most advanced and modern weapon systems. Saab Bofors Dynamics is located in Sweden, which is one of the main companies responsible for creating the high-tech, shoulder-fired anti-missile technologies like the N-Law. BAE Systems in Sweden is responsible for manufacturing several of the world's greatest infantry fighting vehicles. What their military lacks in ground power, they make up for with long-range tactical missiles assigned to their naval vessels and aircraft. Sweden's military is highly specialized for aerial and naval combat because they don't have to prepare for thousands of different possible combat scenarios. Finland cuts them off and buffers them from Russia. They know their country only really has to prepare for a few possibilities, so they focus on optimizing those key areas. Since Sweden doesn't share a land border with Russia, their air force and navy is of higher priority. Their air force has 100 of the Swedish built Gripen JAS-39 jets, which makes them one of the most powerful air forces in the world. Their goal is to hit 2% of GDP spending that's required by NATO by 2028. Sweden's submarines have a strength in stealth. During a training drill against the United States, they were able to sneak up on the USS Ronald Reagan, which is one of America's Nimitz carriers. They also have a large fleet of fast attack boats called the CB-90, which are incredibly maneuverable and able to shoot Hellfire missiles. How long would it take for this application process to go through? Well, that can vary widely. The last NATO member to join was North Macedonia, which applied on March 27, 2020, and they were finally accepted nearly two years later in 2020. But the NATO Secretary General, Jen Stolberg, said Sweden and Finland could be fast-tracked and added within a couple of weeks. So let me get this straight. Joining NATO has a fast pass offer, like waiting in line at Disneyland? Wait a second. All that tells me is that bureaucracy is completely unnecessary. Seriously though, it helps that Sweden and Finland have a strong civilian control of their military, which is one of the biggest conditions for joining NATO. And the countries are all democracies that have been working with NATO for years. Vladimir Putin was having his own meeting at his clubhouse with the CTSO, which is kind of like the Russian Eurasian version of NATO, kind of. There, he said that he would be totally cool with Sweden and Finland joining NATO. I swear, bro, no worries. He said, quote, as for the expansion of NATO, including through their new members of the alliance, Finland, Sweden, Russia has no problem with these states. Therefore, in this sense, expansion at the expense of these countries does not pose a direct threat to Russia, end quote. It looks to me like the aggressive moves made by Russia opened up a political door for them to, so to speak, be justified to joining NATO. We can debate all day about what came first, the chicken or the egg, the Russian aggression or the NATO expansion, but I personally think that this is a good thing for the security of the world. I'm sure some new developments next week will make me eat my words though. It's something they have probably wanted to do for a long time, but Sweden and Finland were unable to do it until now because before it would have looked like they were provoking Russia and their people were rightfully kind of terrified of doing that. Now they applied to NATO together because their security of one country affects the other. I heard they didn't even choose a backup defense alliance to apply to. Flattered. Sweden hasn't had to worry about being invaded because Finland is a buffer between them and Russia, so whatever Finland chose to do, Sweden usually respects that. But what do you guys think of these two countries trying to join NATO? I want to know in the comments section. Thank you for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy, and you're watching Task and Purpose. Remember guys, Conflict of Nations is a free to play game. You can choose your own strategy, engage in epic battles, and take over the world. So claim an exclusive gift, you get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. Offer only available for the next 30 days, so click the link in the description. Choose your country and fight your way to victory in Conflict of Nations World War III.